Canberra is in for a massive shake-up today. The dust is far from settled. The Greens are on the hunt for a bigger meeting space in Parliament House. One of the biggest shifts in Australian political history. Morning, Michelle. How are you? Excited to be back. Welcome to Parliament. <laughs> the Coalition will look to rebuild itself today. There's a bit of a debate about whether the party should tack left to try and win back those moderate Liberal seats. I think we just stay right in the middle. It was all change in Canberra today. Mr Morrison, where did it all go wrong for you? A new government, new coalition party leaders, familiar faces in unfamiliar corridors, new rhetorical formulas being tried out. One team, one dream. A conspicuous new presence of women in leadership positions. This is about the future. A sensible centre is where you win elections. I want our country to support aspiration and to reward hard work, to take proper care of those Australians who short-term or long-term can't take care of themselves. This was all happening even as the vote was still being counted in some seats and as the messages of the election were still being digested. There's obviously been a lot of focus on the many independents who won seats, contributing to a record crossbench of 16 MPs. But just as important in understanding how the election result could change the way Australian politics functions is to look at what happened in seats that didn't change hands and in seats where both major parties suffered big swings to minor parties. The bottom line is that while there was a government losing swing against the coalition, Labor's primary vote also went marginally backwards. Both the Coalition and Labor lost votes to One Nation and to the Greens, a trend that could spell more big trouble for the major parties and force them to change the way they operate in the future. There is a message there for both major parties. It's basically telling them that the way they're conducting politics is not the way people want them to conduct politics. And it's, to a certain extent, a product of our voting system where we have preferential voting, we, we give preferences to parties. The major parties therefore go to the centre, they have a smaller target. Um, it breeds more negative personal politics because they lack that policy differentiation. If you're unhappy with the mainstream or there was a particular issue that you wanted action on and felt strongly about, you really had to go somewhere else um, with your vote to get action on that. That's not necessarily the way our politicians are seeing the outcome though. At least some of them, including newly minted opposition leader Peter Dutton, saw the shift to minor parties as a passing protest vote. People weren't uh, happy with us uh, in the end, that's clear. Uh, they weren't that enamoured with Mr Albanese and I think many of them have sent a protest vote through the Greens and we, we will talk more about that. Whereas political researcher Tony Mitchell-Moore thinks this is just a continuation of a longer term trend. The biggest story in politics, at least when you talk to swinging voters, for a decade now, is, hasn't been whether Turnbull or Shorten or Morrison or Albanese are winning. It's, it's been that they're both losing. That both, you know, there's been this disdain for politics, this perception of you know, personal self-interest and party self-interest ahead of national interest and ahead of the interests of voters themselves. That perception's been there and really strong for a long time. But this election has seen that perception turn into a voting outcome which is literally unprecedented in the modern era. Political scientist Annika Gaulia says you have to go back to the period just after Federation to see the federal parliament comprised of so many independents and cross benches, but that when you do, some striking parallels emerge. I think that in a way, politics has almost come full circle in Australia. Um, political parties just after Federation were seen as uh, rather suspicious groupings, not to be trusted, as something that could compromise the interests of each of the states and the territories. What's even more interesting is that women um, who had just recently been enfranchised at that point were also very, very sceptical of party politics. Um, they thought that the, the party system was something that was designed to uh, represent men's interest. And, um, and didn't really leave much room for women's issues to be discussed in the parliament. It was this period, she says, that saw the emergence of activists like Vida Goldstein. The seat named in her honour fell on polling day to independent candidate Zoe Daniel. What we have achieved here is extraordinary. Holster Jim Reid says the emergence of the independents forced the government to fight the election campaign on two fronts. There was one against Labor, whereas... Basically, Almo, uh, Albo versus ScoMo. 
Um, that was the, the, the air war. And then you had a ground war where you had uh, uh, very local fights with moderate liberals in inner city seats versus the independents and ultimately the Greens as well. And most analysts feel that the independents are a trend that is now here to stay. Look, if, if the major parties can't improve uh, and on, in the way they behave, in the perceptions of the, and differentiate from each other a little bit more, then you have to think the, the uh, independents are here to stay, particularly when it's so much easier for them to reach people through social media. Jim Reid believes that while the independence movement may have hit the coalition hardest in this election, they pose a threat to Labor at the next one. And the next seats to be hit are the inner suburban Labor seats. I think Labor's actually got a big problem here because to combat that, that independent local niche marketing appeal, you have to have quasi-independent members who can speak out, who can cross the floor, who can raise issues of their own. And that's quite difficult in Labour Party's quite strict processes. He says there are problems too for the Liberals in combating the independents. It comes down to mass appeal versus tightly targeted appeal. That changes both their messages and the way their candidates campaign. They're a bit like uh, VB or Tui's. You know, they're always going to sell lots of beer nationwide. But they don't have the ability to to communicate very clearly and concisely with niche markets. So where there's locally crafted ales, they're always going to win um, local seats. And the major parties need to, to combat that. And really the only way they can do that is to allow their candidates to become more like franchisees than employees. No matter what ticket they ran on, this election has also produced a much more diverse parliament. The fact that we've had more women elected this time round, that we have a more diverse parliament in terms of our First Nations representatives, people from diverse ethnic backgrounds, I think that that's going to change substantively the culture of the parliament as well. They are going to be a bad government. There's no doubt in my mind about that. Political analysts say the major parties will have to change their game if they want to survive. Thank you so much. Perhaps recognising this, the new Prime Minister has already said this shift in tone will be a priority. I think politically that's just a really strong idea. In a way, it's just as important as your percep voters' perceptions of how good you are on the economy, on education or health. If he can change the game, if people can have a better regard for politicians, then that's a big political win. Only when they put out a big positive vision uh, will they start to get that primary vote back from the, from the minor parties. Hi, I'm Lee Sales. Thanks for watching this story. If you'd like to watch more of 7.30's stories, they are on the left of your screen. And tap on the button below to subscribe and get the latest from ABC News.